Hello and welcome to the Royal Road School of Carmelite Prayer. We are journeying through the Book of Her Foundations by Teresa of Avila, and today we are going to discover the foundation in Pastrana, which treats of the foundation of the two monasteries there, one for the nuns and one for the friars. They were made in 1570. No, Teresa says, I mean 1569. So all the work on the house in Toledo was completed by the Pentecost vigil. As we sat down in the refectory to eat, a great consolation came over me in seeing that I no longer had anything to do, that I could simply enjoy some time with the Lord on Pentecost. I was so consoled that I was almost unable to eat. But I did not have this consolation for long, though. In the midst of it, they came to tell me that a servant of the Princess of Eboli was there. I really had been in communication with her for some time now about founding a monastery in Pastrana, but honestly, I just didn't think that it would happen so quickly. I felt uneasy. It would simply have been dangerous for me to leave the monastery in Toledo founded so recently, and in the midst of opposition. So I decided not to go. The servant told me that this would not be acceptable. The princess of Eboli was waiting for me in Pastrana. She would not take my refusal. Well, she would take it as an insult. But that didn't change my mind. I still had no thought of going there. I wrote to her to explain my reasons, and the servant went along with them. Moreover, the nuns who were to make up the community had only just arrived in Toledo, and so another reason I couldn't leave so soon. I went before the Blessed Sacrament. The Lord told me to go. The trip was not only about the foundation, and that I should bring the rule and the constitutions with me. Since I heard this, I decided to follow the counsel of my confessor. When Our Majesty wants something to be done, he puts it in their heart. This has happened to me many times before, and it happened this time too. My confessor thought I should go, and with that, I decided to leave. We left Toledo two days after Pentecost and ended up staying in a monastery of Franciscan nuns near Madrid. A lady who was staying there as well in the monastery wanted me to meet a hermit. The thought came to me that I only had two friars. The hermit was there with another brother, and while speaking together, the hermit told me that he wanted to go to Rome. Before going on, let me speak a little bit of Father Mariano, the hermit. He was an Italian doctor to the Queen of Poland when our Lord called him to leave all to better obtain salvation. He had undergone some trials while he was falsely accused, and he was put in jail for two years. While there, he refused lawyers, saying he only wanted to be defended by God and God's justice. Resembling the old men in the story about St. Susanna in the Bible, When each of the father's two accusers was asked where the accused was at the time, one said, seated on the bed, and the other at the window. In the end, they admitted they lied. Father Mariano assured me that he had spent much money 
trying to free both his accusers so they wouldn't be punished by the law. Through these and other virtues that I noticed, he must have merited from our Lord knowledge of what the world was so that he would strive to withdraw from it. He began to think about which religious order to join. None suited his temperament, though, and he learned of some hermits near Seville who had come together to live in the desert. Each hermit lived in a cell, and they came together for Mass. They had no fixed income, nor did they want to receive alms. They supported themselves through the work of their hands. Each one ate alone and poorly. It seemed to be a living picture of the life of our holy early fathers on Mount Carmel. Father Mariano spent eight years in this manner of life. When the Council of Trent took away authorization for hermetical life, he wanted to go to Rome to seek permission to continue as they were. I showed him our primitive rule and gave him reasons about how he could serve God in this habit of Carmel. The next day he called me, rather he called for me, as he had very, he had very determined, he was very, very determined to follow this path. He was really surprised how quickly he had changed. The Lord himself changes hearts. Great are God's judgments. Mariano had gone years without knowing what to decide. concerning his state in life. But God quickly moved Father's heart and revealed to him how God would be served by him. It has cost Father Mariano many, many trials, and the work of establishing the primitive rule of Carmel will cost him more until this rule is firmly established. He is very influential with many persons who favor and defend us. He told me he had obtained a good hermitage site in Pastrana, that he wanted to accept it for the order and then receive the habit himself. I praised the Lord greatly and sent a message to the present and previous provincial since the monastery could not be founded without their permission. Once in Pastrana, I met with the princess and the prince. They gave us an apartment while our house was being redone. I spent three months there and suffered many trials, since the princess made many demands that were not in compliance with our form of religious life. Rather than make a foundation, I just left. I did put up with some things, though, to see the monastery of the friars founded. The importance of this became clear much later. Mariano and his two companions arrived once the permission was obtained from the provincial. The prince and the princess were glad to allow the hermitage given Mariano to now be used for Discalc's friars. Father Antonio of Jesus, the first Discalc friar, was sent for, and I made habits and white mantles so that they could at once take the habit. A father in Medina came with the nuns I had sent for. He himself wanted to become a Discalc. He received, he gave the habit to Father Mariano and his companion, who remained lay brothers. Mariano didn't want to become a priest. He only wanted to be the least of all. But later on, by order of our Father General, he did finally become a priest. Once the two monasteries were established, novices began to enter, and they served the Lord authentically. 
all went well for the nuns until the princess lost her husband and she entered to be a nun. She struggled with the practices of enclosure. The prioress, bound by the council, was unable to give her the liberty she sought. The princess came to dislike all the nuns and continued to cause them problems after she discarded the habit and returned to her house. The nuns were so distressed that I begged the superior to move the monastery to Segovia, where, where they actually did end up moving, leaving behind all the princess had given them. Their departure saddened the townspeople, but I was very happy seeing the nuns at last in peace. The nuns were in no way at fault for the displeasure of the princess. In sum, the Lord permitted the incident with the princess of Abeli. He must have seen that it was not right for the monastery of nuns to be there in Pastrana. Amen. So that completes our discussion of Pastrana and our next session will be discovering the foundation in Salamanca. Thank you for following along. I hope you're enjoying discovering more and more the personality of St. Teresa of Avila and her foundations. Amen.